All right, so I'm Guillaume Plessy. I'm working with uh, Grand Pratico, and I have been working in the uh, drilling tubulars for um, quite a number of years, so pretty much 25 years now. Uh, I'm the director of product uh, management for, for these guys, and I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground this morning. Um, I will probably go a bit fast. Uh, hopefully, uh, you'll get it all, and if you have questions, um, Feel free to contact us. I would definitely uh, like, like to give you more answers if you have specific questions. So, uh, first of all, uh, oh, I just cannot advance my slide. Wait. Um, hmm. Okay. Uh, first of all, when we talk about um, designing a drill string for drilling a well, uh, we have to ask ourselves are we drilling vertical, near vertical, or deviated uh, or expanded rich wells? The reason why we have to ask ourselves these questions is that will impact the selection of drill string content. Uh, also, when building the drill string, uh, the drilling engineer has to think about um, what will be my other challenges and formation influence. Uh, how will this influence my drill string selection? If you expect a lot of uh, tortuosity coming from the formation, uh, if you expect a lot of uh, harmonics and vibrations in the strings because of the formation you're going through, that will impact your selection potentially. Also, the availability of equipment. In, in, the, in our days, it's so uh, difficult to uh, uh, come out there and uh, basically say, I want a new pipe on a short uh, time basis. So uh, definitely the drilling engineer has to think away and look at what's available on rigs for rentals, and if you want specific pipe, needs to basically order it way in advance. Okay, something slow here. Um, <clears throat> so we're looking at two examples here just to illustrate the point. So more, I'm looking at vertical well and horizontal well. Uh, both are 20,000 feet in measured depth and uh, have no torches. It's just for the uh, for the exercise here. What we see is uh, for the uh, deviated horizontal well, we have a much higher torque needed uh, at surface, and that is to be expected. We see that we have some uh, uh, torque ramps or buildup in, in the well buildup or drop off areas. On the other hand, uh, when we look at the tension, that horizontal well comes with a much lower tension in the string, and that is due to the fact that part of the string's weight is supported by the formation. Uh, so, just to, to make it short and summarize, uh, horizontal torque is our uh, issue, and when we go vertical, tension is our issue. And actually, talking about tension, you see the change in slope of the orange line, and that is due to the fact that you have to change the size of drill pipe at certain point because the uh, lighter pipe is not capable of supporting its own weight and having a sufficient uh, level of uh, margin of overhaul. So if we look at what happens in terms of the attributes we need on products, um, in, in a deep drilling, primarily pipe we need to have high tensile capacity. Uh, torque's not going to be much of an issue, uh, and really the focus would be on tension. Um, every weight drill pipe being lower in the string will need to have some buckling resistance. that typically be your transition between drill pipe and, and, and BHA drill colors. Um, so buckling resistance is the main attribute you need of it. When you look at drill collars and DHA tools, buckling definitely needs to be there, and torsional vibration resistance needs to be there too. Um, why? Well, because we may have things like stick and slip, and this will have a potential to loosen or back off connections. So really, you need to have some level of torque um, in, in these connections. If we look at the other side, the ER, the ER drilling, the picture is substantially uh, different. Uh, now, the drill pipe's primer, primary attributes needs to be torque and hydraulics. And actually, some people will say hydraulic is more important than torque, even in these applications. The torsional vibration resistance may need to be here because if we are drilling in with motors in particular, there will be times where the weight transfer will be difficult to, uh, to get uh, all the way to the, to the bottom and to the bit. So, what people will do, they will basically rock their string. Well, when we're doing this, we are applying rotation to the right and to the left. Connection needs to have that connection resistance um, and need to have some, some, some torque capability. Wear resistant is something 
more important now because you will deviate, you will have friction. And while you're having friction and higher side loads, uh, wear will start to, uh, to be a more important component. So you will need to have some options to resist wear. For your heavyweight, still buckling resistance uh, because they could be used in different locations close to the beat and also higher up in the string around the kickoff point. Um, also, the torque will be needed for the same reason as for drill pipe. Uh, torsional vibrations and resistance is the same as for drill pipe. You will, you will have to resist higher torque and you will have to resist these uh, rotation uh, eventually right and left. And for the BHA and drill collars, things are very similar. Uh, it's primary buckling and torsional vibration. So if I am to sum up things uh, and, and really go in a very big summary, uh, for drill pipe in deep drilling, tension is the must. And we'll see what are our options when we look at grades. And for um, the ER drilling, a lot of focus on the connection, as you can see, with the need for torque, improved hydraulics, uh, and also fatigue resistance, which we will talk about eventually. Well, what are we selling? Now, we're not selling cars, obviously, uh, but I'm using cars uh, to make an analogy. What happens is if all you're doing is driving forth and back to the school uh, and you're driving two miles either way in the city, I'm not sure you need the Viper. Uh, it's a cool car to drive probably. It's going to be a bit expensive and also probably more expensive to, ma to, to maintain. So think about what do I need for my project? And I think there is no difference when we look at connections on drill pipe. If you're drilling vertical, uh, probably your API connection is good enough. Uh, if you're doing near vertical and you expect a bit more friction in that well uh, and you need the torque, yeah, potentially you can go to the next bucket. But if you're drilling horizontal, I would think you need to be more than likely on the right two buckets if you have long laterals. Um, the third bucket brings about 30% more torque, the extreme torque segment. And, and in these buckets, you see we have four different technologies, and there are more available out there with other manufacturers. But uh, the point is, they are not all equal, and they're ranked in the order of how much all the benefits they bring to the user here. Delta being the highest, uh, UGPDN being the lowest. Uh, I'm just going to comment on these two. Delta has got all the bells and whistles. It's the latest connection has been put to market. Uh, it's high torque. It's good hydraulics, uh, good fishability. Um, it's also low repair rate. We have monitored the repair rates and it's below 4% for recuts. Um, none of the other connection is, is there today. Uh, the UGPDS on the other end is our lower end. It's, it's a way to get the torque, but because of the thick tool joints, uh, the GPDS will um, uh, require more material um, and, and that will basically impact the hydraulics. Uh, and then the last bucket on the right is really what you will see for challenging offshore drilling or uh, for land drilling, like the second in drilling where the wells are extremely long uh, and torque would be extremely high. <clears throat> so that was my, my speech on connection. It's very quick, I realize, but let's have a look at grades now. So that graph on the left is the NACE diagram for those who are not used to it. Uh, it shows different levels of severity. Uh, when you have H2S, according to the uh, partial pressure on the bottom, or, which relates to the concentration of H2S, if you want, and the acidity of the medium. Uh, the region zero is where H2S has a very little impact on the product. So what you can see is we will use a API product in there. And if we need to have more uh, tensile capacity, we can use the uh, Z140, D150, UD165. And basically, things boils to <clears throat> the higher you go in terms of your material strength, the more tensile capacity you have. Um, <clears throat> so you just adjust your material strength to whatever you need for your uh, well delivery, and in most cases, you're good. There are, cons there are considerations to have there with sharing the equipment to the BOP, but uh, these are things which usually are worked out and there are solutions. So let's focus on the right side, which is the sales of this product. Uh, the industry has got very limited uh, frame out there. The most prominent is probably the IRP spec, and that sets uh, a good frame for product in region three, which is the most stringent. Um, that will require testing to solution A. Solution A is 100% H2S, so it's a very drastic test. 
Uh, I know there are other specifications out there. Uh, THU has got a, a specification for self, self, uh, self, uh, self service products. I know the API is working on something, and we should see something in the API for self service products in the future. Well, because there was a lack of <clears throat> options and offering in the, uh, um, by the industry specification, uh, there was a lot of proprietary uh, solutions offered out there. And I'm only showing a few here. Um, we have products fitting these three uh, regions. Uh, typically, as you go towards region three, your material strength would be lower. So 105 is the highest we can do there. There is a 125 offer possible starting region two, and of course it could be used in region one. Um, and we try to basically organize our product around these regions. One thing to highlight, the HSQ is tested in solution D, which is another NACE <coughs> solution for uh, SaaS service products. It is uh, a good solution out there, uh, um, but there are other ways to do, and uh, I don't have time to cover it right here. Uh, I just wanted to show the range. But really, generally speaking, when the drilling engineer works on that, he has to basically think about what do I need? Do I need strength or do I need SSC resistance? Um, it is important to have an answer to this question because um, this, is, this will impact your, uh, your, the number of options you will have in the end. <clears throat> so it's a matter of priorities. Now I, want to, I want to highlight one thing. Your well fluids could be classified as a region three. If you will be in a position to always have your mud around the pipe, and you control your mud by keeping a pH high uh, and having a concentration which is low enough, you can actually use a region one product to drill a region three well. Okay, so really it's a matter of understanding the pipe and also the medium in which it will be, because mud is going to be a lot less aggressive than the wells, fluids, or whatever you will see when you're production and you're producing. That makes me remind you that this graph here originally is for casing and tubing. Okay, putting drill pipe on it is a bit of a stretch. It's a very good way for uh, the uh, drilling engineers to select the product quickly. So let me change gear uh, and, also, and now start talking very quickly about fatigue. Fatigue is really coming from a combination of bending and rotation. Uh, there could be other factors in there, like high tension and bending, high tension and rotation. Okay? <clears throat> but generally, it's banding uh, and rotation, which is the primary driver. And uh, when you combine these two, you may have problems when there is a stress riser. Stress risers will be most of the time when you have a change in stiffness, a cross section of the product. Like you're going from one size of drill pipe to another size of drill pipe. You're going from drill pipe to heavyweight drill pipe, or heavyweight to drill collars, or different sizes of drill collars. When you zoom in, that would also be extremely localized when you have a pin to box connection uh, <clears throat> and with a, a very different uh, level of stiffness. It could be also stress risers on the pipe body like slip cuts, but I'm not covering that here. So what can the industry do? Well, typically the industry has been using uh, calculations to quantify that risk and say, yes, we're good or we're not too good. Um, when we look at a component-to-component -component analysis, there is a very comprehensive way to do it with TH Hill when we look at the relative stiffness ratio of the different components. And what we do is we make a ratio of section modulus, and there is a range, so there's a, a number under which you can just basically uh, do that change without too much risk for a harsh drilling condition, and there is a second number for um, more moderate drilling conditions. When it comes to connections, there's quite a lot of options, so <clears throat> bear with me here. For API connection, it's also a section modulus ratio uh, for the BSR. <clears throat> and we use BSR primarily for downhole connections like drill cutters, um, possibly anywhere drill pipe. <clears throat> but it's, it's basically a way to see that you're in the right range. BSR is balanced for API connection at 2.5. And uh, API says you can go anywhere between 1.9 and 3.2 and be in the right area. Going outside increases the risk of seeing fatigue failures on boxes or pins. <clears throat> we have a slightly different uh, approach with uh, Grand Prix Co on double shoulder connection because we have two connections. So the rules of the BSR don't apply too much for us. What we do is we do a cross section ratio in different locations, of course. Uh, for our connections, and we aim for one. 
Actually, we aim for slightly above one because we want the box to be slightly, slightly stronger than the pin, as we know that the box will wear when we will rotate it in the hole, in particular against the rotation. There is also another method out there called CFI, Connection um, Fatigue Index, which has been put together by TH Hill. It's a lot more involved, it requires having FEAs of the connection to understand the loads in there. So this is something which we have been questioned, uh, but I don't know that many people are using that uh, methodology in, in, in real life. So that's my blurb about fatigue. <clears throat> Another thing we have noticed is there is a need for more torque in the BHA. And very often it's the four and three quarter BHA which is uh, suffering from a lack of torque. So what we have seen people doing is they move away from the NC38 and they start putting double shoulder connection. Well, the few things I want to highlight there. The double connection needs a secondary shoulder to function. When you look at this, the graph on the left, you see that this connection is missing a good chunk of its uh, secondary shoulder. We have seen that happen because people want to fit something underneath, like an electronic package, uh, a mechanical thing like a valve. Well, having that mismatch there is not acceptable. You need to have a configuration more like the one on the right, where you have a proper loading of your uh, secondary shoulder. Also, these connections have been designed for drill pipe. Uh, so we are trying to optimize hydraulics in drill pipe. We try to have a large ID and we have a balance of the pin in the box that you see on the right uh, for drill pipe. Well, when you say I'm in the BHA and I've got a smaller ID for that upper component, um, <clears throat> that's a problem because you have a very strong pin and you have a relatively weak box. Um, and you want to have that pin to box balance. But not everything is an option. Uh, also, we'd like to highlight that we use specific material strength for our two joints, 120 and 130. It's not necessarily what you have in the BHA components because most drill colors are 110 or 100,000 uh, KSI SMYS. So there is also this to, to keep in, in consideration. Well, ultimately, we have a technical bulletin which will help the OEMs who need to have a solution for their downhole tool and we'll be happy to share it with them. So when we look at the big trends, and I'm going to try to conclude here with two uh, very rapid case histories. <clears throat> the, the two things we see people are doing is drilling longer lateral and drilling more efficiently. And that graph on the right shows it. It shows that we are uh, increasing the length of the lateral, and that's for uh, US land. But what we should also consider is that this is done in the same amount of time. So these longer wells are drilled faster, and that's where the efficiency part comes in. Well, how is this possible? Well, there's multiple factors, but from our perspective, uh, we see it coming from the use of larger drill pipe, uh, typically replacing the five inch drill pipe by four and a half inch drill pipe, and also using uh, streamlined connection with this pipe. So when you're having your Delta 544 on a five and a half inch drill pipe, your tool joint is six and five eight. It's the same tool joint only as the five inch drill pipe. So you can really substitute it without changing anything to your whole size, and you will benefit from having that stiffer, bigger, improved hydraulic uh, from the five and a half inch pipe. And the same trend is seen with a smaller pipe, replacing four inch by four and a half inch with Delta 425. Now there is one, 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 one adjustment that needs to be done there. The tool joint will be bigger. We'll go from four and seven eighths to typically five and a quarter. That bigger tool joint will also require that the whole size is increased a little bit from six and one eight to six and three quarter. Two big examples to support these trends. <clears throat> one Permian example in an eight and a half inch hole, and we're comparing with the same deviated well, five inch drill pipe to five and a half inch drill pipe. <clears throat> in the five inch drill pipe scenario with the NC50 connection, we are limiting uh, on surface, we don't have enough torque. And we have multiple issues of yield and buckling lower down the string. You can see the number of red flags there is high. On the other end, when we go with a five and a half inch pipe with a Delta 544 connection, we have removed the issue of over torque on surface because the connection has got that higher torque capability. We're left with only localized buckling issues, which could be addressed and <clears throat> lived with. The second example is using the four and a half inch drill pipe with Delta 425. In that particular example, the four inch pipe was uh, bringing limitations in terms of the available hydraulics down the bit. 
and down for the for the down, downhaul motor. So what happened with changing the hole size in that case to six and three quarter, the drill pipe size from four to four and a half, and also upgrading the stem pipe pressure from basically 5,000 psi to 7,000 psi, the motor was able to see a lot more flow from 190 to 330. And you also see that the differential pressure available down there went from 450 psi to 1,000 psi. So you give a lot more hydraulic power to your motor, uh, possibly use, you can use a more aggressive bit, and the net result on the overall program is you've saved days of drilling. Uh, things have really worked well by changing the pipe and of course some other components in that particular example, but <laughs> your pipe selection can really have a big impact on your performance. And that should conclude my talk, so thanks a lot for listening and uh, I'll try to answer the questions now. Okay, so um, do we have uh, any questions for Guillaume right now? Um, clarification questions that anybody might have. So please uh, go ahead and uh, ask your questions. Hi, this is Gabriel. Um, Gabriel Drill. I got some uh, question in regards to this uh, new thread that's called XTF or XFT. I think it was the thread relief. Can you give us some more details about it? Sure, sure. Uh, the XTF is a connection we have released in 2003. Uh -huh. uh, the, the, F, the F uh, means that it's got a modified fatigue resistant thread form. Right. It was used uh, initially uh, to drill, uh, to, to do the fast drilling in, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, the operator was in a situation where the pipe body had enhanced fatigue resistance. We use a grade called S135T uh, mm -hmm. for that application. And um, in the end, we saw some fatigue occurring in the connection, which is not desirable. So we modified the um, thread profile to give it a fatigue resistant thread profile, which we also use for BHA components. Uh, so we, we, we have more recently put XTF on drill collars for drilling horizontal wells over here because we wanted to have the fatigue resistance in it. Is it, is it uh, compatible with the current like uh, XT or not? Yes, uh, the XTF39, for example, could be made up to an XT39. Okay. Uh, the torque level is extremely comparable. There is a very small variation. I mean, it's so small. I think we're talking in, uh, in hundreds uh, of foot pound. Uh, okay. So there is hardly any loss in torque capability, but a much improved fatigue resistance. Uh, in the testing, what we found is uh, in the lab testing, we found that the, uh, the, the fatigue resistance was about three times what it was um, without the uh, fatigue resistance threat form. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any more questions? Uh, so, talk. What is your con what is your experience with regards to safety margins, safety factors? Right. Obviously, we have all the data, the max torque, max uh, tensile, and everything of the connections and the pipe and everything else. Um, <laughs> Can you comment on what kind of safety factors, mechanical safety factors, would be advisable uh, for the selection of certain drill pipe sizes and connections? We, we are uh, not typically coming with a clear recommendation there, Roland. Uh, the reason is because it, it's project dependent. Uh, however, there are a number of rules which the industry are following, and uh, typically, when we talk about connection, um, the IADC recommends that the drilling torque does not exceed 80% of the makeup. Um, it's, it's a classic recommendation that we ask people to follow. Don't come too close to your uh, makeup torque because you risk uh, <clears throat> a downhole makeup if there are fluctuations. Um, but really, it depends on the project. I mean, I'm going to take one example here. If you're drilling land and everything is stable on surface, or if you're drilling offshore where you have heave and all the things happening dynamically, 
um, your safety factors may, may need to be higher when you're drilling your offshore wells. Uh, really, uh, we, we leave that uh, to the uh, drilling engineers. Uh, most of the time, Roland, we don't come too much with their recommendation. This being said, there is a thing that people need to keep in mind. Uh, typically, connection breakout before or at a torque lower than the makeup. And that's what we see in the lab. It's not necessarily what people see on the rig, and it could be various reasons um, because the torque may not be changed at every trip. It could be because temperature impact a little bit what's happening down the hole. <clears throat> but normally, if you do a makeup test on surface, apply a certain torque and break out your connection, your breakout torque should be less than your makeup. Uh, <clears throat> it's different for different connections as well, and that may be partly why IADC says you want to have that margin and not come too close. Because your reactive torque typically is in proportion of your applied torque. Um, or your drilling torque. So, yeah, you want to have that margin out there, definitely. I'm, I'm looking at the chat, on the chat lines here. So, uh, we had Mike Attrell, he was uh, asking about a tapered drill string um, for varying uh, torque limits. Yes. Uh, so, can you comment on that first? <coughs> okay. Well, there's two, there's, two, there's two things. If you're talking about a taper string, typically associated with deep drilling. Um, if, if you have to uh, go very deep and use multiple sizes of pipe, it's likely that you will have a bit more torque on surface, but in, in vertical drilling, torque is not really the main issue. I, I suspect that the question is more about, I, I want to use one configuration of pipe lower in the well where torque is less and switch to another configuration higher up. Uh, that is perfectly feasible. Um, you may need to have a crossover sub at the interface. We have no problem with this. Um, now, if, if this is designing a new drill string and you start from scratch, I would say it's probably safer to say I will have the same connection with the high torque capability from top to bottom. But if it's a case where you're using the string of the ring and the rig, uh, the string available in the rig is torque limited, and you can use it for the bottom part and you can rent to top up your string and you want to limit the amount of pipe that you would be renting. Uh, yes, I, I can see that working very well where the rental pipe with a higher torque capability would be on the top and the rig pipe on the bottom will be, uh, will be on the bottom and be there. Uh, it's perfectly possible. Good. Well, thank you. And so um, uh, one more uh, from Zvi Ben Zvi. Hopefully, I pronounce this reasonably correctly. Uh, how about coatings on thread coatings? Um, I guess we're talking about the dope and the 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 the, the, the thread compound. Well, uh, yeah, but also he was asking about um, uh, uh, corrosion resistance. Is there anything um, that's maybe more permanent? I guess. Uh, one of the things to highlight is drill pipe connections are made up and broken out multiple times. So um, uh, um, coatings on pipe uh, will be subject to a lot of uh, wear uh, and they have to last. Uh, and and that's, that's a true challenge. Uh, for, for now, the protection um, that we have to prevent corrosion is really the dope uh, and, and the thread compound that we apply on, on rig. Um, and as much as possible, keeping your connection clean. So when you break out your connection, I would say that at least your pin needs to be uh, rinsed. Uh, and, and it's going to be a rack on the rig, rig floor, and there would be some splashes and things happening there. So it's really difficult to have no contamination or no, um, no, no fluid basically hitting the connection. Uh, but I would like to see a, a rinse and try to keep everything as clean as possible. So wipe your pipe on the way out, break it out, get most of the mud out, rinse it and rack it back. And uh, when you're having a completion fluids, which tend to bring a lot more uh, corrosion on steel, uh, definitely the rinsing is more important and possibly use some sort of a mesh or sort of material which will allow for the corrosion fluid, which is slowly pouring from inside the pipe, I get it away and not on the connection, basically. Um, but it's, it's difficult to have no, no corrosion. Um, we actually have increased uh, the tolerance for corrosion on threads uh, in a few years back. 
uh, in, an, in order to basically help the pipe owners and uh, to limit the amount uh, of rejects. But uh, pitting on the root of the first, of the last, sorry, of the last engaged threads, which are the most uh, uh, stressed area of the connection, uh, is still not tolerated. So yes, a uh, minimum amount of effort to, uh, to rinse the connection is necessary. So uh, one final question for now, where we'll be able to invite more questions later on uh, towards the finish, from Nicolas uh, Manesh. Um, how about the, do we have any offset, do you have any offset data uh, for fatigue resistance? Uh, like something like these, like on, on materials, metals, we know these Smith curves, right? These endurance curves. Uh, is there anything that's published or available um, on, on that line? Um, well, uh, fat, fatigue, there is a lot of tests done on fatigue uh, at the level of connections. Um, we also do fatigue tests for products like risers on the, on the product completely. Uh, it is the, uh, um, the pipe built, welded, and we subject it to, uh, to, to, to vibration. Um, the thing is, whatever we do in the lab is, uh, is, is only good in the lab. It's not the real drilling conditions. You do not have the action of the drilling fluid or the sea water on the outside of the product. Um, it, it's, it's really extremely difficult to come with da data set which would be representative of what happens in the field. Uh, the closest we would be uh, is, is doing a, a test in air and then having tests in the medium, uh, like mud or seawater, but you cannot do it on the full size joint of drill pipe. That's what I'm trying to say here. So you can have uh, ways to derive uh, small sample data and apply it to the, to, to the life of the product and derate the product life this way. Um, but it's, 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 there is somehow not a direct correlation. That's what I'm trying to say. So the answer is no, basically. Yeah, um, the answer is no. Okay, good. So thank you very much, uh, Guillaume. A great presentation, appreciate it. Uh, now we are to our second presentation from Tenaris. Adonis, please, um, if you would like to share your screen and start your presentation as soon uh, as you're ready. All right, let me know, please, if you can see my screen without any yes. problems. And, and we also can read the disclaimer at the bottom of your slide. All right, so no investment decisions based on uh, this presentation, please. Um, good, yeah, so thank you for the, the invitation. Um, just a quick overview about Tenaris. Uh, uh, we manufacture and supply uh, steel pipes and offer related services to the energy industry. So we manufacture in the US and nine other countries and have a global presence in segments such as uh, tubulars, premium connections, uh, line pipe, coil tubing, and uh, soccer rods. In terms of uh, technical services, our well-designed solutions team uh, supported hundreds of customers on queries related to string design and casing installation since its inception. And that's also uh, where I work. So we're with uh, the well-designed solutions group at uh, Tenaris. Um, it is estimated that as much as 15% of the wells drilled in unconventional place in the past 15 years have experienced some type of well accessibility or well integrity issue. So in the next 15 minutes, let's just explore some of the challenges uh, casing sees uh, in these wells and ways to solve it. Activity in the, the unconventional space uh, has been enabled by key technological developments in uh, both drilling, just like uh, Gum was, uh, was showing earlier with the uh, connections or new ways to, to measure while drilling uh, or log while drilling, new types of drill bits or mud conditioning, um, as well as completions. Uh, we've seen great developments in uh, frac plugs, uh, novel frac slurries, as well as uh, data acquisition methods or data interpretation methods to estimate frac growth. Uh, with oil country tubular goods or OCTG being a, a key element of the, the well construction process, we have developed new products uh, deployed on various steel grades and pipe configurations to meet the demanding conditions of these uh, shale wells or multi-fractured horizontal wells. By far the, the highest loads are seen by the production casing string, which will also make the focus of, uh, of my talk. So 
We will cover challenges for casing strings and unconventionals. We'll do a quick overview of uh, materials consideration and look into connection selection. So by the end of this talk, you will be better equipped to, to make decisions on casing string design for unconventional wells. So let's imagine you, you finished drilling and tripped your drill string out of the hole from your record setting well. It's now time to install and cement in place a production casing string, but uh, while doing so, you run into some issues. So you end up maybe having to wash and ream the string to bottom, maybe apply some excessive set down weights, potentially running into issues later while stimulating or producing the well. Uh, it turns out that this is a common issue. Most of the times it's generated by buckling and or by, by poor wellbore cleanup practices, uh, wellbore stability or wellbore quality issues and so on. So what are the implications of this? Um, first, when casing does not reach the well total depth, we lose time. We might damage the connections of the, or the pipe body depending on casing installation practices while running into such issues. And we might lose lateral length and associated production from having to call a well short, so to say. So in the, the chart below, you have a rough estimation from publicly available data on how much some operators produce per thousand feet of lateral length. And this is average across all basins, so uh, don't, don't pay too much uh, attention to the actual numbers. But depending on the oil or natural gas price, hopefully uh, positive prices, losses in the, the first year may exceed the cost of the well. Now, assume that you installed and cemented the casing, but once the completion team starts running frack plugs in hole, they get stuck at a certain depth. So you run into what the, the industry currently defines as a well accessibility issue. This leads to, to non-productive time, crew and equipment delays, uh, fishing or remediation costs, as well as loss of lateral length and production or delay of production. Um, in more severe cases, you may run into a well integrity issue with obvious more negative implications. Uh, there are also a few special load scenarios where um, we may run into loss of well accessibility, uh, such as non-uniform external collapse loads or formation movement during stimulation. Uh, luckily, these are not very prevalent in the US, but it's still something that's worth considering in the, in the design phase. So before we go into, into challenges for stimulation and production, let's quickly uh, get a refresher on the, the main loading modes of tubulars and oil and gas wells. We got external pressure, we got internal pressure, we have axial and torsional loads. So when talking about the performance metrics for the, the tube or the connection, we're talking about resistance to collapse, resistance to burst, uh, tension and compression capacity, and in a lot of cases, this uh, may be different for the connection and the pipe body, as well as bending capacity. Finally, talking about torsional loads, uh, connections usually have a, an operating and a yield torque, for uh, at least for casing and tubing. So what are the challenges that tubulars uh, see during installation? Like mentioned earlier, when passing sections with high dog leg severity, the string experiences bending stresses. Uh, frictional forces uh, increase in long laterals to the point where compression and buckling become a problem, with most of the, the buckling being seen in the, uh, the section above the kickoff point. So to overcome axial drag, rotation is initiated, so that high torque capacity and fatigue performance, especially across these high dog-like severity zones, are, are needed. These features, of course, should not come at the cost of uh, makeup time, as connection runnability in this environment is an important uh, feature. During uh, stimulation, the requirements for the production case string are, uh, of course, burst capacity, so resistance to high internal pressure, pressure during uh, frac, uh, resistance to tension induced by the, the temperature during stimulation, as well as resistance to erosion uh, from the turbulent flow uh, coupled with the abra abrasive particles of the, the frac slurry. Uh, there is also a need of corrosion resistance, uh, and this corrosion might be uh, generated by, let's say, non-formation sources of uh, H2S or additional hydrogen. Uh, finally, when the well is put to production, connection sealability, compression, uh, burst resistance and resistance to erosion are also uh, very important. So talking about corrosion, string design is done with regards to the, to the downhole environment as well. And this is where the material selection comes into play. Uh, Tenaris manufacturers 
broad range of steel grades to meet the most demanding well conditions, augmenting the used API steel grades. So the API steel grades usually used, for example, for surface casing, we will look at a J55. Uh, for intermediate casing strings, we will look at anything from an L80 to a P110. Um, and so these uh, improved steel grades uh, that are used in unconventionals either show some improved collapse ratings, uh, they're fit for mild sour environments, uh, such as the Eagle 4, for example, or they uh, uh, have controlled yield, also fit for more severe conditions. So um, in unconventionals, like I said, there's this need for restricted yield, improved collapse, resistance to a mild sour environment, and all of this while being cost effective. So uh, for example, by using a improved collapse steel grade, you're able to withstand higher collapse values, but without increasing your wool thickness, and ultimately your, your string weight, and uh, increasing the cost of your, your weld. Now, Looking at connections, uh, their selection is defined by clearance needs, sealability, axial loads, burst and collapse requirements, and the needed torque capacity that we discussed earlier. So these define the connection attributes, and most of the times all of these are interconnected. So uh, you can decide now if you are looking at a coupling or an integral connection. Uh, if you're looking at an API uh, connection or a proprietary you look at the type of thread profile, the torque mechanisms, as well as the need of a metal to metal seal, depending on the expected pressures during uh, production and the production fluids. Here's the market evolution over the, the past six years. Here we can see a, a clear correlation between the increase in lateral length uh, and the adoption of proprietary connections, which uh, aim to tackle the, the challenges I mentioned earlier. So let's have a look at how connection features impact their, uh, their service fitness. The connection type to start with will influence clearance and axial strength. For example, uh, threaded and coupled, which is the most common and robust connection type, offers less, less clearance, but a higher axial strength than uh, integral flush joints. Most common for production casings uh, are uh, threaded and coupled connections, an integral semi-flush, shown uh, here as the third one. Um, for intermediate liners, we sometimes see flush connections being used depending on the, the depth, uh, so the entire length of this uh, liner and the tensile capacity of the connection. Looking at thread components, and let's take the example of an API buttress, uh, their geometry and profile influences uh, maximum tension, compression, and bending ratings. Uh, here you can see the, the load and the stabbing flank of the connection uh, with the box on top and pin on bottom, as well as uh, where the connection makes contact, the root and the connection crest. Uh, torque mechanisms, be it a shoulder, a pin-to-pin -pin contact, or full contact threads like a, a wedge-type thread will enable rotation, while sealability will be given by the, the thread profile and uh, the dope up to a certain level, or a metal-to-metal -metal seal. So API connections are typically used in applications with reduced mechanical loads and non-problematic environments. API round, for example, is a common connection for production tubing and sometimes surface casing. It is easy to manufacture and run with a, a known field history. However, it has low tensile resistance and due to how forces are distributed across the thread profile, it may lead to jump outs, which, which are costly. Uh, it also relies on thread compound for sealability, so it is only limited, uh, is only fit for a limited pressure range. Now, API buttress is a, is a connection with proven field for performance as well. It's easy to manufacture, easy to run, uh, and shows a higher tensile resistance compared to the round. However, the connection has poor sealability and high hoop stresses and does not allow rotation. The, uh, the J area also shown here in the, the bottom brings concerns about erosion during uh, track um, due to the turbulent flow that I mentioned earlier while uh, pumping track slurries. This profile is uh, actually used for, for many proprietary connections such as the R6P buttress. This is a buttress modified, uh, fully buttress compatible connection that provides 100% compression capacity and extra torque capability through a positive sh uh, stop shoulder shown here in uh, the second uh, cutaway view. The shoulder also covered the J area of the connection, minimizing turbulence and erosion generated by flow during uh, hydraulic stimulation, 
and production in case uh, some some fine sand are produced. FEA confirms that the, the connection has lower hoop stresses as geometrical interference is not as severe as in a buttress. Um, these hoop stresses are a problem for their role in coupling cracking, of course. Um, and this connection has an operating torque of 25,600 uh, 25, foot pounds, making it fit for rotation in uh, medium to long lateral wells with uh, a low open hole friction factor. Now, other proprietary connections would display a different thread type. Here we have a, a full contact thread, the dovetail shaped wedge thread. This was developed initially for very demanding applications such as offshore low clearance or ERD wells where rotation, tension, and compression are, are a must. And here you can see the dovetail shape on the, the wedging mechanism that kind of cha changes uh, the width as we, we advance. And uh, yeah, these uh, connections uh, basically uh, were developed, as I said, initially for a more demanding scenarios, but we took lessons learned from previous wedge series and implemented them to create a product fit for unconventional applications. Such a product would be the Tenari Side Reel 461. Um, this connection offers extreme torque performance and 100% compression efficiency that's developed through the simultaneous engagement of the opposing flanks of this dovetail thread that I showed earlier. So it's a popular connection in wells with medium to long laterals, as well as for rotating while cementing, which uh, um, started picking up as uh, more and more operators have been seeing issues in getting uh, good cement coverage across the lateral and also into the, the vertical. For uh, high pressure applications where sealability is required, another product would be Wedge 463. This uses the, the sphere to cone seal from the Tenaris Blue technology. Uh, the operating torque for these last two connections is uh, 37,700 foot pounds for a five and a half, 23 pounds per, per foot P110 ICY pi body. So that's about 50% higher than the, the buttress modified that, uh, that I showed. And actually the entire series 400 was manufactured with runnability in mind. Uh, so all of them show a lower number of threads per inch and a deeper stabbing depth, uh, reducing connection makeup time. They also have a, a makeup confirmation mechanism that eliminates the need of a torque turn graph as shown here in the, in the top uh, picture. An additional and final step that we take is a rig demo at our facility in Veracruz. Uh, here the connection is exposed to running conditions that are more severe than would be expected in a, in a lab environment. Uh, this gives our personnel the chance to familiarize themselves with the products while also proving robustness even under peculiar scenarios, uh, such as shown in these pictures with uh, over doping or uh, over torquing the connection, uh, making up the connection at a, an RPM higher than recommended, uh, or making it up for while the rig is, is misaligned. And in the end, this is just a, a good opportunity to show the, the product robustness and uh, just make sure that uh, also our personnel, including our field services personnel, gets used to, to the products. So that's kind of everything that I had. And I hope that through this short talk, uh, it was made clear that uh, there are no such things as uh, cookie cutter wells. Uh, so tubulars, especially uh, on the stimulation and production side, encountered very demanding loads during the well life cycle. Uh, that created the need for steel grades and connections developed specifically for these challenging conditions. Um, and an engineering-based product selection enables the success of completing, stimulating, and producing these wells in a safe and cost-effective manner. I hope we still have some time for, for questions. I also have my email address here in case uh, we can cover them all. All right, uh, very good. Thank you very much, Adonis. Uh, very informative. Um, so if you have um, some questions, uh, please uh, post those. Uh, so Mike, uh, Mike was asking or is asking uh, pros and cons about floating, floated casing. So are there any issues? Uh, sure. that you can see um, what are the things to watch out for. 
Yeah, so running buoyancy assisted uh, tools is very popular uh, and it's a very efficient way to reduce string weight while uh, trying to, to land the casing string in, a, in longer laterals. Um, I would say, uh, so a lot of the, the, the wells in Eagle Ford and even uh, Permian Basin and uh, Utica and Marcellus are, are using this uh, technology. Uh, the, I would say the, the advantages are clear. Uh, maybe on the disadvantages side, something that uh, we've seen is uh, just in case the uh, buoyancy assistance uh, gravity tool, for example, or the, the float sub fails, then uh, you need to make sure that you have a plan B. So you do use a connection in the top section at least that would enable you to advance by using rotation. Um, another issue would be, um, let's say, if you have the need to circulate, for example, taking a kick, you would have to, to break that and uh, kind of uh, see how you, how you advance from there. Um, and again, every time you need the, to circulate or you need to uh, rotate and circulate, you're kind of limited by, by that tool. Uh, I have a question. Um, there has always been the discussion, like what kind of wellbore tortuosity or dogleg dog um, severity uh, can a casing uh, withstand? So I saw on your on your testing slide, you said, or well, it showed that, okay, we'll bend it, I get by 20 degrees across 100 feet, and then we apply, I think, 40,000 cycles. Um, so where do you see is the mechanical limit or when when you when a casing runs runs into the well bore, what kind of doglet severities would be acceptable without catastrophically failing the casing? I mean it's understood that there's an increase in torque and drag, but when would you see maybe a casing that fails to seal and, and stuff like this? Yeah, so that's a very important uh, aspect of uh, connection design and selecting a connection, especially for applications where we expect rotation. Uh, in that uh, case that I showed earlier, um, for this particular connection, which was a five and a half, 23 pounds per foot, uh, 463 on a P110 ICY material, um, the connection was exposed to 40,000 cycles. Um, and this is mostly, uh, let's say, trying to replicate the need of reaming in the casing uh, or looking at, um, let's say, rotation while cementing, where you will be rotating in a static point for an extended period of time. Uh, the way we look at this is we have a proprietary tool uh, that takes all the knowledge from our, uh, let's say, fatigue testing, so all the SN curves. Uh, and we we apply miners rule to kind of estimate uh, the remaining life on the, the connection while performing these uh, operations. So we'll jump right into it. For, the, for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with Carpenter, uh, Carpenter is the oldest specialty steel mill in the United States. Uh, we've been producing specialty alloys for over 130 years. Our, uh, our materials melted, forged, and finished in the United States in either our Reading, Pennsylvania facility or our Athens, Alabama facility. Uh, our key markets, we focus on aerospace, defense, energy, medical, transportation, and industrial. And we bring those, uh, the knowledge that we've gained in those other markets into oil and gas and use them in drilling and completions. So when it comes to non-mag drill collars, there's basically three grades throughout the industry. The most common grade is covered in API spec seven. Uh, in the past, our 1515 LC, which is that standard grade, has been the go-to grade for, for flex and flex collars. It has minimum yield strength of 110 KSI. Uh, this is the lowest grade cost, lowest strength, and has the least corrosion resistance of these three grades. In uh, in recent years, we've seen our uh, 1515 HS Max 140 KSI high strength non mag alloy become a lot more common as the industry has moved towards longer laterals and increased torque output of mud motors. 
the our, our HS Max alloy is is used a lot in the extended reach shale formations where corrosion is an issue due to the brines and, and chlorides. For applications where there's there's high chlorides and low pH levels or H2S, we recommend going to a, a chrome nickel moly alloy, which is our SCF19. It's uh, the chemistry of this material um, make it a really good candidate for areas like the Middle East or up here in Canada where I'm located, where the there isn't as there the, the chlorides are a lot higher and the the pHs can be lower, which which basically leads to degradation in the material. It could be in one well. So there are two major factors to consider when looking at corrosion, corrosion resistance of a non-mag material. Uh, the chemical makeup of the material plays, plays a major role. Um, the industry standard that, that we use is the, is the PREN mod formula for pitting resistance. It, it accounts for the percentage of alloying elements uh, that increase or reduce the resistance to pitting. The higher the PREN mod value, uh, the less susceptible that alloy is to pitting. So if you look at the two pictures on the bottom of the slide there, you can see the pitting after 300 hours on the standard chrome manganese alloy versus the chrome nickel alloy after 1,000 hours. The both of them were used in the same region um, in the same types of environments. Another concern for, uh, for non-mag alloys is stress corrosion cracking. Uh, this is commonly referred to as SCC. Um, to have SCC happen to your material, you need three things, a uh, material that's susceptible to it, a corrosive environment, and a tensile stress. So removing any one of those will eliminate SCC from happening. Drill collars are, are most susceptible to SCC on their IDs and heat affected zones around hard bands or welds. When, when the forged non mag bars are drilled, and the surface of the ID becomes in tension. So we have a few ways to put that surface back into compression. Uh, shot painting the ID can create a thin layer uh, of compression to remove the tensile stresses. Uh, that layer is thin though, and it, it can be removed by normal drilling operations, just from the erosion, uh, from mud flow, wear from MWD centralizers. Uh, shot painting is recommended for the heat affected zone around hard bands and wells, just because of the, the adaptability to shoot at different angles and create that compressive layer in different areas. The other option for you is hammer peening or roller burnishing. Uh, that creates a little bit deeper compressive layer, about 60 to 90 thou. That lasts much longer than the shot peening on the IDs of collars. At Carpenter, we have a proprietary bore treatment uh, that creates a compressive layer up to 188 thou deep. And it in in provides an increased resistance to stress corrosion cracking versus the other two methods. So one other thing to consider when you're selecting the material for your non-mag um, is how it affects your makeup torque. Yield strength uh, is directly proportional to makeup strength. So any increase in yield strength will increase your makeup torque. For example, just by switching from the standard 110 KSI grade to the high strength 140 KSI grade, you'll increase your makeup torque on the same connection by 27%. Uh, another easy way to increase your makeup torque is by switching to a thread compound that has a higher friction factor. And the, the standard API friction factor is uh, 0 0.08. Uh, we recommend non-mag materials have, uh, the thread compound for non-mag materials have a higher friction factor that's 
15% above API. Uh, we also see a lot more, uh, a lot less thread repairs and reduced galling due to these, these thread compounds. And the higher makeup torque reduces the likelihood of downhold makeup or connection movement downhold due to stick slip. Uh, if you look at the table at the bottom, uh, just by switching to the 140 KSI 1515 HS Max, uh, you can gain just 4,600 foot pounds on torque to yield for an, a standard MC38 connection. And then if you switch the material and the thread compound, you're, you're gaining over 7,400 foot pounds in that same, same geometry, same connection. So keeping with connections, uh, when choosing what size of collar and connections to select for, for your BHA, you also need to consider the bedding stress ratio of the combined tool joint. Uh, ideally, you want your BSR to be between two and a quarter and two and three quarter. To ensure that one member of that tool joint doesn't overstress the other and cause premature failure. Uh, the high, a higher BSR will cause pin failures and a low BSR will cause box failures. You can see from, from that chart there, the OD of the tool joint, you increase the BSR, creating overly stiff box and a weaker pin without a whole lot of change in, in torque. So if you've looked at single shoulder connections, you've looked at what materials available, what thread compounds you can use, and, and that's not getting you to where you need to be for your, your application. You can go to uh, double shoulder connections. Uh, this will reduce your, your chance of downhole makeup even more. That increased contact of the secondary shoulder on a DS connection uh, allows for a lot higher torque ratings than a single shoulder connection. Uh, something to keep in mind, so is the, the pin length and box depth on those double shoulders is critical. The, the gap at the secondary shoulder when the primary shoulder engages is roughly the thickness of a human hair. So if that gap isn't correct, you can, the connection can be stressed unevenly and, and fail prematurely. Due to those, those tight tolerances, we, we don't recommend that these tools are are refaced in the field and that they go back to the town and have them uh, serviced in in a machine shop that's certified. So the other way to increase the longevity of your connections on, on non-mag DHA components is, is shot peening. That'll create that minimal compressive layer, but it allows the, the thread compound to, to stick to the connection a lot more easily. It will also increase your galling resistance. Uh, then there's cold rolling. That will create a deeper compressive layer at the thread root. And in the studies we've worked on, it'll increase your fatigue life three to one. Uh, one of our products in development is a coating that will resist galling and increase fatigue life. We're, we're currently testing this coating and it should be available later this year and we'll be able to to publish and distribute more information on that once it's complete. And then our engineering department uh, works with operators and directional drilling providers to, to recommend materials and connections for their applications. We'll sit down with you and go through everything that we're able to offer, um, what connections are available, where, you, where your advantages and disadvantages are based on what your needs are. and and help you, you know, improve your performance and reduce your overall cost on those BHA components. And if you guys have any uh, any other questions or anything, feel free to reach out to us at the email address or post your questions here. I potentially have one for you. Uh, this is uh, Guillaume Plessis asking. Um, my understanding of uh, non-magnetic drill collars uh, when we were making them and we were using the Carpenter product 
was that um, typically the uh, material has got extremely high impact and fatigue is not so likely to occur, but the area where, where the material was uh, uh, giving uh, some pain was, it was basically struggling with the multiple make and break that are necessary for drill string. So what I'm trying to say is you probably will need to rebuild your connection because of going quicker than um, you will ever have fatigue occurring in this product. Is, has anything changed with the new alloys? Uh, that our SCF 19 max material has a very high fatigue life, fatigue life compared to the other non mags we have. Um, I'm not sure if we've published that data, but I can, uh, it's available that I can send it to you. Very interesting. Thanks. We, we typically recommend connections being recut every 300 hours. Do you, ask me again, sorry, I mean, I, I don't hear about now the question, but uh, do, do you um, also have some sort of treatment for the internal diameter? I kind of missed that part. Uh, I think I seem to remember that you were not doing uh, hammer pinning, but you were using a different technique, correct? Yeah, we have a proprietary bore treatment that creates the compressive layer. It's, it's basically double the depth of hammer pinning or roller burnishing. Okay. Sorry, Roland, you were on mute. I didn't hear if you had a question. Yeah, so uh, I'm relating a question or a statement from Herman uh, Vicharondo. And so uh, he says that very often non-conductive compounds are used. How does it affect the MWD communication? Do we know anything about that? So the, the, the thread compound that we recommend is non-conductive, and it has that higher friction factor to increase your makeup torque. We, we don't sell dope or thread compound, but we, we recommend a jet lube NCS30. That's what we've seen the best um, results with. Okay. How about our saber sets? And, and, you know, my experience is not make dirt color as a wild bag, but I mean, when we started into that, um, we tried copper coating, all kinds of stuff to resist galling. And so, uh, then eventually we also introduced saver subs. So um, um, is this, you know, so you don't have to, uh, you could save the majority of the color material if you would have to replace a saver sub every now and then. Is it still, still being done today? Is that still an option? No, typically we, we see customers wanting less connections in the hole. In fact, there was, there was one customer that we worked with in the Permian uh, that's been running a specific set of tools on about 18 rigs. So we supplied the, the components from the top sub of the motor all the way up to the crossover at the drill pipe. And they wanted to limit the amount of, amount of connection changes in there and have makeup torque of 29,000 foot pounds on all that equipment in a five inch string. So we've been running that in, in the Permian for just about a year now, since last May. So that would, that would include your UBHOs, your float subs, your, your drill collars, your stabilizers, um, and then your crossover to surface to, yeah. to your drill pipe. Do we have, what, are, what is the trend or is there a trend? Obviously all of the API dimensions are all basically, uh, or, or, or values are basically for a 211.16's ID, right? Um, many in the- I, mean, I think they're more towards two and a quarter actually okay. in API. But two but, and 11 is the common diameter for five inch. Or but many, many specialized drill colors for MW, in particular MWD have larger IDs. Um, so does this typically then uh, uh, push people to go to like your SDS-19 or comparable material in order to make up for some of the, the losses, I guess? So in, in standard collars in the five inch, five, I would say five and a quarter to four and three quarter range, we, we see basically two and 11, six, 
seen side D throughout that string. Uh, mm -hmm. As you get bigger in the six and three quarter, six and a half, we see three and a quarter IDs. We recommend the SCF 19 when, when you're having corrosion issues. Um, we've seen a lot of success, success with that here in Canada where there's been some, some low pHs and, and chloride counts of over 300,000 parts per million. And then in the, in the Middle East, we've seen that, that material be successful in H2S environments. So we really, you're getting with the, the 15 HS max, if you're able to control your chloride and your pH, that material will, will probably get you through. If you can't do that, then switching to an SCF-19 would be the way to go. They both have the same yield strength. So you're not you're not going to gain anything on strength by switching to the SCF. All right. Just Very on good. corrosion. And then uh, just I want to just alert everybody that Tony Collins just posted that non-conductive dope still allows good conduct for EM telemetry. So apparently um, the the coating or a dope uh, is is a, a lesser lesser concern doesn't seem to produce any type of problems all right do we have any more questions for rob uh sorry i had a question i did post it in the chat here um if you just comment on connection life as relates to thermal cycling when breaking connections with thread compounds is that a consideration in uh material or connection selection what, what kind of temperatures are we talking about are you talking about like when when you're using like torque lock on a connection and breaking it that way or just there. down hole? Hello? Okay. Hello? Uh, we may have lost him. But I mean, uh, yeah, can you just, is there any consideration on temperature that we typically would see down hole uh, in this regards to connection fatigue, uh, connection strengths, Rob? Is, is there anything, anything? Not in the, not in the standard down hole temperatures that we see mm -hmm. of 175C is typically the, the hottest hole we'll see here. Okay, good. So, yeah, all right then. Thank you very much, Rob. So finally, I would like to ask Todd from Enable Tech to uh, share his screen and his presentation. And uh, Todd, please go ahead and and uh, share your screen. There you go. Can you can everybody hear me? Yes. Excellent. We can see the enable tech shop floor and we can hear you. Excellent. Uh, well, I will definitely, I know it's been a, uh, I appreciate uh, everybody staying to the end and I appreciate the opportunity to do this. Uh, recognizing that enable tech is a manufacturer and I really am here to introduce the benefits of flow forming. I work with guys like Rob and Carpenter and Bowler, uh, Josh Rooker and guys like that to help me on the material sides and also with the engineers via if it's Halliburton, Baker, Schlumberger or, or the OEMs of uh, other MWD shops to help me design a product that uh, is good for them. So I'll kind of go through what we do and how we can hopefully benefit the MWD and benefit. Uh, I had a bio on here, something we do, but I will say that uh, more importantly, we're one of four flow formers in the US. We're one of the only ones dedicated to the oil and gas market. This process is mostly for missiles. It's how you make uh, housing, skins, nose cones for rockets. And so we noticed this technology and we actually started introducing it about four years ago to the oil and gas markets. And uh, it's been a slow climb, but we've got uh, specs in it, most of the OEMs now. And I'll kind of walk you through a, sh a short video here of kind of it explains it visually better than I can explain it because it's kind of like a, uh, an enigma surrounded by a mystery. So I will let you watch it. And uh, by the way, everybody here is always welcome to call me and I'm willing to do tours so they can see the process uh, itself. So here's a quick video. Can you hear it, Roland?
this product right here does not exist wow. because it's 190 yield strain. So this is a 25,000 PSI nitronic barrel. They don't exist unless we make them. Enable Tech creates these custom tubes through a CNC machining process called flow forming. The creation of those long tubes begins in the engineering department using the customer's final product dimensions to calculate the size and shape of the blank, often referred to as the preform. The fabrication of the preform starts like most do with bar stock that meets specific material needs. Enable Tech's quality control officer ensures they have the right product for each job. I make sure that they meet our specification and then I check a max permeability to make sure that it, it meets the max permeability requirement. The magnetic permeability of a material indicates the ease with which an external magnetic field can create a higher magnetic force of attraction in the material. This is a vital component for MWD tools. In the machine shop, initial material prep involves cutting bars to length and drilling the inside diameter to spec. Enable Tech fabricators then CNC the preforms to engineering specifications in preparation for flow forming. These preforms are approximately three feet long before they are mounted to the mandrel to begin the flow forming process. This is where the magic happens. The preform is slipped over an inner mandrel and secured into place. Then three rollers apply uniform controlled pressure to the outside diameter of the metal. While the mandrel rotates the preform at high speed, those rollers are pressing 75,000 pounds of force to the exterior of that preform. The preform material is compressed beyond its yield point. This is a process known as plastic deformation. The outside diameter of the preform is reduced and the available material volume is made to flow longitudinally over the inner rotating mandrel until the desired final length is achieved. The CNC cooling fluid must keep the preform material just below the recrystallization temperature in order to achieve this process. Since the finished tube doesn't need cool down time, it's ready to go to the last phase of the manufacturing process. And this is a part of a quality process where we're actually drifting the tube for the OEM's specific drift sizes. We're able to hold 2,000 tolerance across the entire ID of the part. We are, one, checking all the tubes for straightness. This particular product has to be within the 5,000 foot for straightness. So we're just making sure that our process is holding to that specification. In this case, we will go down, we'll check it every foot as he's doing here, and we will bump straighten this product just to ensure that the customer receives the product in the exact straightness requirements that he needs. After going through a final quality control check, these Enable Loy tubes are ready to ship. So uh, appreciate y'all watching the video. I guess uh, the uh, visuals explain more than I can uh, just talk about it. But real quickly, what is flow forming? And uh, it is a chipless metal process for manufacturing seamless cold work uh, tube tubulars. Um, and obviously we explained a little bit about the plastic deformation and the benefits of that is me being able to get higher yield strengths and doing that cold by, uh, by keeping the recrystallization low on the, on the actual physical material. And then obviously engineered mechanical properties. We actually design our preform so that you, the customer, tell me what it is you're trying to achieve. If you want a nitronic at 190 yield strength, so we're getting close to 30,000 PSI, I can design something and work with that. You need to understand is elongations, what do you need? And then we play around with some of that and working with uh, uh, companies like Carpenter or Bowler or, or, other, or, or Universal or other people, we can work with them and sometimes even, even materials to make sure we can accomplish what it is you want. And we'll get into a little bit later talking about how that keeps me from having to do heat treatments afterwards, which is also another cost and lead time issue.
So once again, benefits of flow farming, uh, metallurgical, dimensional, and economic. Uh, we'll start off with the, uh, the metallurgical here, and that is uh, the physical properties. So in some, in some instances, we are able to one, engineer that and get a 100% uh, increase in the actual yield strength. Uh, refined microstructures and uh, expanded material selections. And what I mean by that is, for instance, some of the other uh, MWD, LWD guys out there are able to use a nitronic 50 barrel in lieu of a 718 barrel. What I mean by that is, is that we've ran some testing with them and that they're able to take a nitronic barrel, get the uh, 180, or um, we guarantee a 160 just because across the board, that's probably the most stringent uh, requirement but also we know that in the past, Nitronic 50 has a, a temperature degradation of about 20%, whereas 718 is 8%. So when you're trying to hit a certain pressure rating at a higher temp uh, and your 718 is at a 150, uh, you know that you're safe in your safety ranges of, of your pressure ratings and yield strengths with a 718. But if I'm giving you a 190 or, e or even that 160, even at 20%, you're still able to hold that percentage rating you want and that pressure rating for that particular material and the nitronic seems to perform very well in the chlorides and some of the other uh, more corrosive environments. Um, so dimensionally, um, obviously when I flow form, the tubes that you're seeing on the videos and here on our picture are directly off of the machine. There is no after processing, turning, polishing. We guarantee a 32 RMS on the OD and a 16 RMS on the ID. So also I'm making the tube to net. Generally when a machine shop purchases tubulars, they're gonna give themselves stock so they can turn the OD to ID and so they can get that concentricity where they wanna go. Typically we're able to hold about a 1,000th tolerance on the concentricity um, and we can hold on most of our LWD, LWD products, our IDs are a half thousandths tolerance to one thousandths tolerance across the entire tube. We guarantee a five thousandths. And I just say that because different materials respond differently. So to have a standard, uh, we just say that. But if you need something better, talk to us because what we can do is we can adjust feed speeds and preform into how we need to do that. Sometimes there may be some slight cost difference differential there, but uh, uh, we can talk about those products and what you need, but obviously the benefit of that is the machine shop on most of our products is a cut, thread, and ship. So they're looking at buying the tube, and also when we make the tube, we make the tube to nest your, in your parts, so there's not a drop. So when you're making a tube like this, and you're spending whatever that may be, 16, 20, 20 bucks a, 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 an inch, you don't want to have six, seven inches of drop. So typically, whatever we do when we make a tube, is we make a tube so that the smallest drop would be a usable part for, uh, for, for your MWD product or whatever, whatever other products you're, you're making. So uh, once flow forming allows for precision and straightness concentricity, it also allows for OD and diameter changes. Uh, in some of our customers, we can, we can do an integrated pin in a box. I can build up stock on, on, on the ends. Uh, for aerospace type stuff, we build up the stock in the middle so they can trim the, uh, they can trim the middle and tune it so that when it's spinning at high revolutions, you don't have a lot of wobble. That is also a benefit to flow forming for some of our other MWD customers. They're running a higher RPM on their tool. So if you don't have precision straightness, you start getting whip. And when you start getting that whip, you start getting wear in other areas on the tool, so you get premature failure. So having a straight tool is very important for if you're trying to run a faster R RPM on the tool. Also, superior finishes. We also found that by having a very and I'll tell you, most of our stuff is better than the 32, but we guarantee the 32, it gives us a better uh, uh, erosion. Uh, and also because of flow forming, you get an almost burnishment on the exterior. So you get almost a 50 hardness on the surface, whereas I'm about a 43 mid wall hardness. But that benefit is uh, that, that surface hardness also gives you uh, some, uh, some, some erosion resistance, which gives you some better downhole life. And also something that we haven't gotten into a lot with a lot of customers is because of our increased uh, pressure rating, you can thin that wall out. So if you're trying to cram some more electronics or you're trying to get a bigger battery to get better life, it always seems like the MWD tools chasing the motor. If the motor lasts longer, if it's MWD failure, the MWD lasts longer, the motor's trying to get uh, uh, better there. So what we're trying to do is help our MWD guys uh, put all the stress back on the motor guys. 
So, um, so hopefully that increases that longevity there. Um, and then here we have economic benefits. And I've kind of talked about a lot of that, but a big part of it is we reduce scrap. And uh, so you saw that three foot long tube, that three foot long preform turns into a 157 inch tube. Um, and so normally the conventional way of doing that would be, you would have to go buy a 718 or MP35N or C22 or whatever that stock is. And you would bore the entire thing out and then you'd have to turn the OD to ID to get the concentricity. And also for us, net shapes uh, reduces machining time. The refined mi microstructure gives you some uh, extended tool life, uh, increased yield strength, uh, which allows uh, that part to have a better, pr better pressure ratings, but also weight reduction. I know that's not always in oil and gas something we're looking for, but hydraulic cylinders and things like that, we believe it or not, on some of the big tractors and stuff, they are trying to reduce weight. Um, increase, and then also increasing of strength, and then also enable, I mean, the, uh, this also enables us to uh, lower alloy costs by achieving uh, properties that you would only be able to get through higher cost alloys. So in an example, there are situations where we've used C22 in lieu of MP35N, we have a $16 a pound alloy instead of a $90 a pound al alloy. Um, we also are able to use, like I said, a Nitronic in lieu of a 718, $4.50 alloy instead of a $16 alloy. So in this competitive market where you're looking at a reliability issue downhole, you're also looking at trying to eliminate erosion. You're also fighting your competitors on cost. A lot of times we're a good benefit to give a shout to because we can look at trying to reduce that cost while increasing reliability and increasing uh, your corrosion resistance. And a lot of times when we're working with uh, some of our mills and market and some of our partners that we do with them is that they're able to help us work with you on the engineering side and talking through uh, some of the other issues that you're having so we can create a solution uh, that best works for you and your uh, and your particular client or customer. So here's our capabilities. Uh, our outside diameter, one and a fifth or 1.2 to 24 inch OD. So as you start looking at tools, you can see that we can do a pretty small ID up to a 24 inch o o OD wall thickness, two hundredths to, uh, to three quarters thick. Um, and max length is 20 feet. Now, so the length is sometimes, for me, depending on the mechanicals, because how much reduction I have to be able to do uh, limits my length sometimes, because if you're trying to hit a certain mechanical, uh, I, I particularly, or, or we particularly like to not have to do a heat treatment. There are times that we can flow form product, do an annealment, and then heat treat up just like we would to a 150, and we would meet your standard spec. Uh, whereas other times we like to deliver it in the uh, cold form condition because it gives us the, uh, the true benefits of flow forming. The inner di diameter and outer diameter, we can we, we guarantee in standard uh, plus or minus five thousandths on the tolerance, five thousandths per foot on straightness. In the video, you saw the bump straightener. A lot of times we do not have to bump straighten, but I will tell you that uh, in some, uh, from heat to heat, some materials respond a little bit differently. So sometimes we'll get a little out of tolerance on straightness, but we'll put it back in before we ship. Um, surface finish, as you see on the ID, 16 RMS, and a surface finish on the OD is 32. And uh, on the right alloys that we form, there's many alloys that we've done there. Uh, doesn't mean we're only limited to those alloys, but those are some things uh, that we know can be done. Um, and a lot of them we haven't, uh, some of those we haven't done a lot of extensive flow forming with, but if it's something you're looking at, uh, we, we can discuss that as well. Uh, here's the capabilities for them. Now, I don't want to get locked up on this a lot, but you can start seeing typical room properties here of an Abeloy 50. This is something we ran a few tests on, a 95. We, like I said, we don't guarantee a 195, and that's just because we get it a lot of times, we don't get it every time. So what I don't want to do is run a batch and get a 185 or a 180 and we scrap it because you wanted a 195. If you need the 195, you have to tell me that's what you have to have and we got to do some, uh, we got to work with some different uh, material and heats of, of different uh, uh, mills so we can guarantee we can get that. But as you see a 195 with a 15% elongation um, and uh, we you know, always look at the 718 there, which you're having a 192 and a 12% elongation. Um, and then you come on down to like the Enabloy uh, uh, MP35N. We've run those and we can run those in the NACE grades as well. When you get into the MP35N and I'm saving 30 to 40% of the scrap, 
sometimes I can deliver a net finish to cheaper than you can buy the raw stock. So just an idea of sometimes how we're able to save material and uh, or save money while increasing your mechanicals and uh, delivering a part that uh, you're not going to have to have someone go out and do a lot of machining to as well. Here's just a quick alloy comparison to like standard AMS 5662 to uh, then the uh, Enabloy product in the middle of what we're able to get on, on yield strengths and tensile strengths and then your high strength. So you can see sometimes we'll get a considerable from standard 260% uh, increase and then uh, in some of the uh, uh, yields. Uh, but as you look across there, there's some of those uh, those different charts are you just kind of see the benefits of flow forming uh, if you need those kinds of strengths and you would like to use the corrosion resistance of those alloys. Uh, and so the reason why this is important is that a lot of people go to an AMS book and they just flip through it and they say, okay, I need this kind of strength. So I need a 150. So I got to use 718. A nice part about us is you can give us a shout, let us know what you want and we can actually make some alloy recommendations, but I will say that we always put it back on your engineers and working with a mill to talk through with us about what's the most important thing that we're looking for here, not just uh, to make sure the performance and what you're gonna need is, is, is what's best. Because like I said, we are just a manufacturer of the, of, of the tube, and a lot of times we're really reliant on the engineers of the application. I'm not a driller. I've never uh, gone out and ran a rig, so I can't tell you what the environments are gonna look like. We just have to go off what we have of past experience of what we've heard from our customers and working with guys like yourself uh, and getting feedback from y'all really helps us too as well. Cause a lot of times we'll get back with customers and they'll share mud reports and how things are performing, which I'll show you here in a minute. Uh, just, a, just a test that we ran with somebody. Um, and it allows us to grow our uh, uh, like portfolio of business uh, when we're servicing you to tell you, hey, this has performed well in these environments and these alloys work well, then overall it's your decision to make in the end. So here you can see, this is a uh, customer ran a Nitronic 50 barrel along with a beryllium copper barrel in the same hole, same well, at the same time for 250 hours. And uh, as you can see, the beryllium copper there on the left is pitted, tigered pretty well. The, you can see the interconnect there where it's worn down pretty well. The nitronic barrel looks brand new. So that is, and that was ran in a, a, a out in West Texas. So you can see there that uh, when we're running this type of product, the benefit there of uh, running a, and also, back I'm kind of stammering here, but part of that is, is a lot of these customers will stock a beryllium copper, a 718, a nitronic 50 tool set, whereas we're getting a lot, some of our customers just saying, we don't need to carry, we don't need to carry tough met barrels. We, need to, we don't need to carry all these different uh, grades. We'll just carry a nitronic barrel and cover it all. And we don't have to have three different types of stocking programs and asking people where they're drilling. And so that's one of the benefits here is that this barrel is pretty much, it's, it's performing well. I won't say it's the, uh, it's the uh, silver bullet for everything, but for a lot of the well, it's performing uh, well and lasting three to six times its, uh, its competitor out there. And uh, anyway, so yeah, questions. And if you have any content, more than welcome to uh, contact me or email me. So, that's it. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you very much, Todd. Very interesting. Uh, so questions for Todd? Uh, what comes to mind? I think you answered one question to some extent for me. You said, I, I, I thought you said that you can add connections on the end. Uh, is there any provision to do an internal or external upset? I mean, anything that is not uh, fully uh, cylindrical. Uh, is, is this something that is a capability that you guys might be able to offer? So, uh, yeah, so most things need to be cylindrical. Um, especially on one end. So we can machine parts, like you could, you, you literally could machine a flange and then flow form out from that. You'd have a monolithic flange, so you would eliminate the weld at that point. Uh, you would have to have just the machine part and you would put the flow forming on, on, on the other end of the part, just knowing that the mechanicals would be different from the flow form to the, uh, to the actual machine right. part. Um, we can do upticks on the OD, not on the ID, because obviously it's going over a mandrel. Um, yeah. 
it is possible. Uh, we just haven't played a lot with collapsible mandrels and doing stuff like that yet, but it, it is possible to do. Uh, but this is not something where we're, we've gotten to at this point. But yeah, so, uh, but there is times you can, you can build stock as you, because the flow formers are CNC controlled. So uh, basically you can build stock up on the OD as you go down the tube. So it could have uh, ramp ups in the middle. It could have ramp ups on the end. Just uh, the ID is a different story on, on having buildups. Yeah. I can do it on one end, not the other, because you have to be able to strip it off the mantle. Okay. Uh, Joey Hopper, WWT International, posted a question in the chat. I'm wondering, does uh, this flow forming technology have the capability of placing multiple drill holes through the ID of a tubular, say like uh, a two inch OD with a three eight center line ID and then three additional one quarter inch holes along the uh, axis of a tubular? No, unfortunately not, because it's the way it's working is there's one centered mandrel. So for me, it's the concentricity. It would smash everything else together. It's, so in order, to, in order to flow form, I have to plastically deform the material from surface all the way to the mandrel ID to get the same mechanicals all the way through the material. Okay, makes sense. I, I thought that's what I saw in the video. I just wanted to confirm. Oh yeah, good question. All right, any more questions for Todd? Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again, all of you. Uh, uh, I would like to express our appreciation to the presenters of, of doing an outstanding job in our educational quest, you know, while everybody's kind of locked up at, at the house. And, um, and we'll continue down that road, uh, you know, until all of these restrictions are lifted, uh, the IDD will continue to provide uh, uh, this, this service uh, to the industry. And so next month we'll have, we'll talk about rotary steerable systems. We'll also have um, uh, drilling optimization software events. Uh, so please, Keep your eyes and ears open. Go to our website, and um, and uh, we are all looking forward to see you and hear you uh, uh, during our upcoming webinars and in sessions. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Have a nice weekend. Be safe, and uh, good luck to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roland. Thank you all.